Hey, everyone, happy Sunday. It's me, Pastor Darren. I am by locating, which basically means that I'm two places at once. Kind of, sort of. So I am in Moravian Falls with our team. I'm there with uh, Michael Kabiski and Pastor Anthony, Pastor Corey. Um, and I'm sure we're having a great, a great time. I'm also here by way of video. This is actually my first time doing like a video message uh, into our church um, body. It's not the first time that we've done this as a church. But the first time that I actually get to speak into our body um, by, by video. And today is... A very important Sunday. This is a very important week. In fact, with it being an election year, we've been waiting the entire year for this week. This is, um, this is election week. It's also possible um, that by the time you watch this, by the time you're in the service, that the article could have already come out um, in Seattle Times. And so I'm hoping and believing that that, that is um, great <laughs> and, and, and amazing and also trusting that God's grace is going to cover this week. It's, he's going to cover this election and that God's will is going to be done. His kingdom is going to come. And so uh, I know that we as a community, we are covering this week in prayer. We're covering our president in prayer. We're covering our nation in prayer. And I can't wait to hear of the testimonies from our night of prayer on Friday night. We are a praying church. And so anyways, this is, um, is going to be quite an amazing week. Now, we are uh, studying the book of 1 Corinthians. In fact, we're in a study that we're calling Church under fire. And this is a expositional study of First Corinthians, meaning that we are studying this book chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Uh, an expositional study means that we are expounding on the scriptures, meaning that it is our desire to approach um, this book, First Corinthians, and to unpack um, the context of the text, because you can do two things. You can expound on to open up, or you can either, if you're not expounding on, then you could actually be imposing on. Um, to impose on something is to perhaps take just one verse and then to take everything that's happening in the culture, take uh, the political atmosphere, take wh whatever we're going through as a church, wh whatever else like that, and to impose. Um, our narrative upon a, 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 a specific text. And so, in fact, we're going to be studying stuff today that perhaps you've only heard, heard taught in the context of just one verse instead of the context of the entire letter. And so some of this is going to get very, very interesting today. In fact, we're going to do something that's quite aggressive, and we're going to study um, the entire uh, uh, chapter, uh, chapter 3, we're going to take on, we're going to bite off a really big chunk of text today. We're going to study 1 Corinthians chapter 3, the, 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 the entire chapter. And I've, I've actually titled to today's message, I've given it the title of the series. So we're calling this Church Under Fire. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to dive right in. We've got a lot of verses to cover. Um, t uh, 23 verses that we're going to be covering. So I'm going to dive right in. And then as we're reading, um, I'll do some catch up and some review. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. You guys ready? Come on, I can't hear you. You guys ready? Awesome, awesome, awesome. Here we go. But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh. As infants in Christ. So I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even now, you are not ready, for you are still of the flesh. While there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another says, I follow Apollos, are you not being merely human? Okay, the problem that Paul is addressing, the context here, um, and if you've been here the last few weeks, you know what it is. Yep, it's division. So Paul is writing a literal letter to a literal church to the, the, to the believers uh, in Corinth. And he's sending them this letter, and, the, and he's going to be addressing many different issues 
um, many different areas where the church is falling short. And the first issue that Paul addresses is something that we don't wrestle with in America at all, but it's division. Right? Like, like we're not a divided country, right? <laughs> okay, so, um, uh, and, I'm, and I'm having fun, but um, yes, the, 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 the church in Corinth was divided, um, and, um, and to a great degree, um, uh, we, are, we are quite divided in our country today, and even quite divided within the church today. Now, um, what happens is, is that Paul actually shows them why they are divided. And this is what we've been looking at um, for the last few weeks. And then he gives them a solution, and that's what we looked at last week. And so um, the reason why they are divided is because they are ascribing their allegiance and, and their devotion um, uh, and ascribing wisdom um, to human mediators. And so Paul's going to get into this again here um, when, he's, when, he, when he says, um, again, um, uh, uh, the, the, some of you say, and this is verse 4, I follow Paul, and others of you say, I follow Apollos. And so um, Paul already hit on this, right? He said, um, here, here, here's, here's one of the things that's going on, is that um, you are misdefining what wisdom is. And that was last week, that we looked at this place of what is worldly wisdom versus what is spiritual wisdom. So I'm going to catch you up. Here's the review. There's two kinds of wisdom. There's worldly wisdom, which is the Greek word cosmos. Okay? So when we say worldly wisdom, we're not just talking about, you know, um, uh, 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 a sinful, pagan, evil, you know, uh, uh, like when we say worldly, we've got a lot of baggage that goes along with that word worldly. That word worldly doesn't mean bad. It means cosmic. It means created wisdom. It means um, one definition that I came up with uh, for us last week is that worldly wisdom is wisdom that is tethered to any sort of creative uh, knowledge. So chronos knowledge, timeline-based knowledge. It's understanding that wisdom is the accumulation of data that's been stored up through people's lives and the lessons that they have learned. Now, when we say that that is what wisdom is, and we and we say that that is how we're going to, we want to live wise lives. So then what we do is we start looking at um, various authors. And we start looking at these scribes and modern day scholars, whether uh, Christian or secular. In, in Paul's context, the people that he is saying, I follow Apollos and I follow Paul. He puts himself um, in that mix. These are good authors. These are good thinkers. These are Christians. And so what's the problem with saying, hey, I am following a Christian. I'm following Christian wisdom. Here's my question, you guys. How can Christian wisdom be worldly? Because that is the assertion that Paul is making, that you are following Christian authors receiving their wisdom, and yet we still have a problem, a problem that's leading to division. And so this is what we're going to be looking at this week because Paul's just going to expound. Paul's just going to say, hey, let's take the microscope a little closer. Let's take a closer look at really what is going on here. Two different kinds of, of wisdom. Um, cosmic wisdom, wisdom that is accumulated by data um, uh, that's been perceived and accumulated and collected over a period of years, learning from let people's lives. It's taking good people and elevating them. It's taking good knowledge and elevating, and elevating it to becoming the primary source. And Paul would say the problem with that, with that is that there's a different kind of wisdom. There is a spiritual wisdom. And so this is going to begin to frame out this entire um, uh, 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 chapter 3 is again looking at two realities. A, a cosmic reality and a, a true heavenly or a spiritual reality. Um, there is a, 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 there is the flesh and then there is 
the Spirit. And, and we're going to get into that here in, uh, in, 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 in a second. And so um, I love what he is saying here. Brothers, we've got division. And he said, I would love to begin to break down the breakdowns. I would love to um, get into the meat. I would love to get into the deeper things with you, but you are not ready yet. I'm having to give you milk because you're still acting like babies. He says, you're not ready. You're, you're still in the flesh. This is what he says here. Um, there's still jealousy at work within. What's, what's jealousy? Jealousy is when your heart starts to get triggered, when other people start to get more successful than you. That, that jealousy is that place when you want to see somebody torn down or you want to see their identity um, reduced um, when they're being celebrated, when you deserve the celebration. That jealousy um, is associated even with the spirit of, of murder and hatred when we're not able to partner with anybody because of our desire to be seen and known and celebrated. That that jealousy is always associated with an orphan's disposition, with, with somebody that's believed a lie that they don't have a heavenly father and they believed a lie that their performance determines their value. And this is what Paul says, you're acting like babies. And not only like babies, you're acting like orphaned babies. And here's the thing is that you're not babies. You're adults. And here's the other thing. You're not orphans. You're sons. That there's, there's strife. There's hatred. There's jealousy. There's division. There's factions. There are all of these frequencies that are anti-heavenly. All of these frequencies that are anti-Christ. He says, I would love to address you with a different message. I would love to send you a letter giving you some really deep meaty revelation but you I, I would love to send you some some truth but here's the truth you can't handle the truth and so he says here here's here, here's how, how I'm going to sum up this this portion of text he says Corinthians you're acting like humans man what an insult right have you ever had somebody say to you like Oh, you're acting like such a human. And you'd be like, yeah, uh, um, right? Uh, okay, so that's because, like, uh, I, yeah, I am. I am a human, right? And, uh, look, look at what he says here. Um, you're not ready. For your, your, you're not ready for, for truth because you're still of the flesh. You're still acting like just a created being. Look at this here. I hear there's jealousy and, and, and strife among you. Uh, and here's the problem. You're not of the flesh, but you're still behaving, this, uh, this is verse 3, you're still behaving, you're still acting in a, in a, in a human way. This is what he says, you're not, you're not, you're not of, this, uh, of this cosmic order anymore. You've been, uh, you've been adopted and brought into a higher heavenly state and, and reality. Here's the problem is that you're, you're acting according to the flesh. You're, 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 your soul is still... Um, tethered to this cosmic order when 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 you're when you're a part of a much higher way a, a higher order here's 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 the problem here's here's why you have division you're acting like a human and you are way beyond human he continues in verse 5 and this is what he says and and what then is apollos right what is paul he says who am i servants through whom you believed, as the Lord assigned each. This is what he says. Who's Apollos? He's a pretty cool cat. Who am I? Hey, I'm pretty legit as well. We have been assigned by the Lord. He said, and we all have d different parts of the play. Verse 6, he says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. What's, what, what's he saying here? He's saying, hey, part of the problem with your division is that you have been ascribing value and in hi hierarchy based off of revelation, style, and preference. So this is what you've been saying. You've been saying this particular human 
Christian author, thinker, pastor, prophet, apostle is more important because of the fruit of their ministry. They're more important because of their level of influence. That this is what you're doing, that you are, you are ascribing success because of earth's metric system. The problem with that is that this is the kingdom of God and in the kingdom everything is radically different than the finite, limited, foolish ways that earth operates. This is what he says, in the kingdom of God, there is an equality that is ascribed to the entire family of God. Therefore, your revelation does not make you more important than me in my way. That your influence does not mean that you have more value than myself. That your prophetic accuracy does not give you more value, more sense of purpose in the kingdom than somebody else why because you might do great at what you do but you are only playing a small part that this is what Paul says that the kingdom of God is composed of and, and, and we will definitely get into it Paul will definitely break this down more but he says Apollos he just plays a part he goes I I just play a part and so before you worship me because of what I have done done and before you worship Apollos because of what he has done before you end up making some pastor or prophet or apostle before you end up making some church your source of revelation this is what Paul says you need to realize they are playing a very small part of a very big picture we all play a part our value is the same because we are all sons. Like in my family, I have um, uh, one son and three daughters. They are all equally my children. They all have equal value. Now Abigail, she's 11. She's the eldest. She's the oldest, honestly, at this point in time, the most responsible. Um, uh, Abigail uh, uh, can do a lot of things that, uh, that the others just simply cannot do. In fact, Victoria, right, who, who, um, who's just over a year old now, she is a baby. And so her special talents include um, pooping and peeing in a diaper. She can't even use a toilet yet. Um, she can really only say one word, and that's no. Um, she wakes up usually at 4 a.m. and wants me to wake up with her. Victoria doesn't cook. She doesn't clean. She can't can't make me breakfast. She can't clean her room. So who is more important in our family? Abigail or Victoria? The truth is they are all, um, Andrea and I, these are our children. They are our children. They all have equal value and importance. And that what they do does not determine their value. It does not determine um, the level of honor that we should associate towards them. They are our children, therefore we love them. And Andrea and I will do everything possible to make sure that they are leveraged to succeed in their lives. And the same is true within the kingdom of God. That when we say that this pastor is more uh, 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 valuable than this, than this than we say this prophet has more revelation than that, I don't really subscribe, that what we're doing is we're acting earthly. We're acting like humans. And this is what Paul says, we are not of this order. We are not of this age. That we are part of something that is intergenerational, that we are a part of something that is, is not cosmic, it's not even interplanetary, it is something that is spiritual, it has been something that has been born of the spirit, which means that now we are not ordered by the influences of this created order and age, but we are now influenced by the holy, pure, beautiful spirit of Christ Jesus himself, the Holy Spirit. Two realities, two dispositions, two 
principalities, two ways to think, two ways to function, two ways to do church. This place of not just honoring men of God, but worshiping functionally and practically men and women of God is our source of revelation. Replacing Christ Jesus, we get to say, I worship you, Jesus, but practically and functionally, our heart is divided because we have ascribed, it's not Christianity, it's the worship of a human with a great thought, with a great idea, with great fruitfulness, with great influence, but we have given our heart to a person, not to Christ, and we have alienated the rest of the body of Christ. I will only associate with a church that's associated with Bethel because they accept the, the like, ah, yuck, I won't even associate with Bethel because they don't even, they're not even going after by location. <laughs> like, 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 they're not going after the deeper thing. Oh, oh yuck, I won't associate with, with the Baptists because they don't speak in tongues. They're only into water baptism. Uh, uh, yuck, I won't associate, you know, with the Catholics. The Catholics are calling the Pope, the Pope just you know, and what we will do is we will alienate, we will divide, and we will, in doing so, we will elevate our own sense of importance, our own sense of value on the earth. What is that? That is jealousy. What is that? That is hatred. What is that? That is division. What is that? That is antichrist. What makes us at Seattle Revival Center better than, um, than, uh, than the Presbyterians um, uh, that meet in uh, 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 Bellevue First Press? What makes us, Seattle Bible Center, better than the believers at Bellevue First Press? Nothing. We are equal. We are sons and daughters of the Most High. God, that they've got a part to play. They've got a, a scroll uh, to fulfill. That we've got our own um, blueprint and mandate that they may uh, sow and we may water. But it, it is God that brings the growth. <sighs> It says here in verse 10, and according to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I lay a foundation and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds on it for no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold and silver and precious stones, wood, hay, and straw, each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. Verse 15, if anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only... Um, uh, as through fire. Now, the context here is the building of the body of Christ. He's talking about the church. This is what he says. We're building something. Hey, Corinthians, you're building something. Hey, Seattle Revival Center, we are building building something. What's the foundation of what we are building? It is Jesus Christ himself. That Jesus is the foundation of the church. And yet we have been entrusted. We have been empowered. We, we've got an obligation to build something on the earth that's a glimpse of, of heaven. It's a prophetic drama. It's a portal to see that realm which is to come. That's what the church is. And so he says, so we're, yep, we're building something on a foundation. And he says, and we will use different materials. And, and there will be gold, and there will be silver, and precious stones, and there will also be um, wood, hay, and straw. And the promise is this. The promise is, the day will come. This is what he says. The church will come under fire. He says, now each one's work, verse 13, will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test and sort out what each one has done. As the church comes under fire, we get to see what is going to last. And we will see that the materials matter. We will see that our hearts matter. We will see that 
our motives matter. And we will see that there is a promise here. The fire will come. The fire is good. The church will come under the fire and the fire will prove the worth of that which has been built. That when the challenge comes, that when the fire comes, that when Jesus comes, this is good. This is on one hand somewhat terrifying. Why? Because there is a pruning, because there is a lot of changing, because there is a lot of repenting. We see that this year in 2020, the first time that I know of where it was actually illegal to go to church. We're actually um, hosting a church meeting would, would bring about very serious consequences. In fact, we know of people um, that were arrested because they continued to um, host um, church meetings. We, we, these, these stories are not foreign. This wasn't in China. Uh, this wasn't in Russia. Um, this is in the United States of America. And for a lot of us, our systems were not able to continue even if if we were set up for media, which we were at Sarah Bible Center. We continued with media. We continued with meeting online, but we were not allowed to meet in person. We were not allowed to be together. So then what does discipleship look like if our only way of gathering is, is on, what is, um, uh, what is uh, assimilation and receiving people into the, what is what does it look like to bring people into the cultures of our church that that how do we do this? And so we did our best, but, but here's the thing. There's a certain level. I, I think this is really just a rehearsal of fire. A, we could call it a fire drill in, 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 in America. I, I definitely believe that what 2020 has been is a fire drill to let us know how prepared we are. And, and, and to be honest with you, what I'm seeing is that um, we are not ready at Seattle Revival Center for 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 a, for a real fire that and, and you say well what do you mean what do you mean by that well you know for example I was just thinking just recently what if you know you know there's there's ten thousand people um, well more a little more now that they put in in, in, in the city of Newcastle uh, that's a lot of people majority of which. Uh, don't go to church and don't 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 believe in in Jesus, um, but that certainly is a lot a lot of a lot of people. And so let's say that um, 120 people um, wanted to get saved and they wanted to get filled with the Holy Spirit and they wanted to plug into SRC and they wanted to do it today. Our systems as a church would not be able to facilitate um, that quantity of fish now let's just say that every quarter we had 120 or 150 people coming in getting saved getting filled with the spirit getting delivered of demons. Let's, let's say that that was happening um uh quarterly as exciting as that would be we are still not putting a dent in newcastle let alone we're not the newcastle revival center we're the seattle revival center you say, Darren, why, why, why are you talking about it? Because, because you guys, um, we aren't discipling Newcastle, let alone discipling nations. Like Jesus said, here is the great commission. To go into all the world and make disciples of nations. And, 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 here, and here's what that means. We need to rethink everything in such a way that when the fire comes we can function we can function efficiently we can function biblically and that means that discipleship is happening not just from Darren on a screen but that every member at Seattle Revival Center knows how to disciple someone into a relationship with Jesus they know how to cast out demons they know how to see people filled with the Holy Spirit and they know how to bring people into a Seattle Revival Center culture they know what our cultures are they know what our values are and I'm telling you if I had 12 people that that were equipped to do that and each of those people were to begin discipling 12 to 15 people now we're talking about the kind of numbers that I that 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 that, 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 that I just mentioned and this is what we're going to begin doing we are going to rethink this whole entire thing in such a way that if anything were to happen to our building we would be just fine why because we have prepared for the fire we have 
prepared for the flame. This is what we say, that, that a great Sunday morning event in this building is not the win. The win is that unbelieving people are coming to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. That people are being discipled into a radical intimacy dynamic with their creator. The win is that every member of Seattle Revival Center knows how to do the works of ministry. For it has been given to the church, the office of the apostle, the prophet, the pastor, the teacher, and the evangelist, not just to have microphones and not just to demonstrate works of ministry, that these offices exist for the equipping of the saints for works of ministry. Seattle Revival Center, this is our time that we together would step into this incredible commission, this mission, this battle, that we would enter into this place. It is our responsibility to disciple Seattle, the Pacific Northwest, the West Coast, into an intimacy dynamic with the creator of all things. Here's what this means. This means that we've got to get back to the book of Acts because I'm telling you this, that, that as long as churches all around the world keep trying to be Willow Creek, we are going to neglect the Great Commission and we're going to continue to call success filling seats. That Jesus never said the goal of the church is to fill seats. Jesus never said it is the goal of the Christian church just to get Republicans nominated. It is the gift of the Christian church to make sure that hope is alive in every single nation. That people could be brought into this revelatory dynamic where they are convinced that they are not orphans, but they are sons and daughters of a mighty God. We've been tricked. We've been lied to. We've been told that this is a script for what church ought to be, and it looks nothing like the book of Acts. It looks like what everybody else in town is doing, and this is what I know. How do you know that you're following Jesus? Because you're doing things that have never been done before. Why? Because that's what Jesus did. Jesus did things that had never been done before. He taught things that had never been taught before, that he confronted impossibilities with the supernatural power of his Father. Everything is changing. Why? The fire is coming, and only that which is of heaven will remain. See, that's very unsettling. Yes. Because we will see the wood, the hay, the straw, the stubble. It will go up in flames and the gold will remain. In verse 18 it says, let no one deceive himself if anyone among you thinks that he is wise in this age. Here's what he says, if you think, hey, I, I know a lot, I, I know what's up. He says, then you are in grave deception. Let him become a fool. That's what he says, let him enter into, through the doorway of a fool so that he can step into wisdom. For the wisdom of this world is folly with God for it is written he catches the wise in their craftiness and again the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise and they are futile verse 21 he says so let no one boast in men let no one boast let no one brag in in human beings for all things are yours whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or or Bill Johnson or Rick Joyner or Darren Stott or this style that preference that model or the world or life or death or present or the future all are yours and you are Christ and Christ is God's. We are being faced with the greatest challenge the American church has ever seen and it's happening right here and it's happening right now and the question is where are you? And why are you where you are at? Right now I could, I, I do not care about the, politi the political messaging and, and the Marxist this or the Marxist that, that I am not afraid of any of that. I am afraid of God, that I want to fear the Lord in such a way where all of this other stuff does not shake me. It does not bother me that when the reporter from the Seattle Times asked me, like, Pastor Darren, can you honestly say that if Biden gets elected 
expected that you're not going to become pessimistic and that you're not going to lose hope. And I, and I told the reporter, I said, listen, if Biden gets arrested, lives are still going to be transformed. Seattle Revival Center is still going to grow. And our region is still going to be transformed and changed because my hope is not in a political system. My hope rests in Jesus Christ. Governor Inslee is saying stay home, stay safe. Do that unless you're a Christian. If you are a Christian, it is time to go. Go where? Go into all the world. Go into your neighborhood. Go and do what? And to bring forth the good news of the gospel. The gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Where are you? Why are you? And will you be able to stand when the flame comes? Our, our religion will not remain in the flame. The only thing that will remain is that pure place of intimacy and connection and desire and fellowship with our creator. That our philosophies, that our preferences, that our, I'm going to take a stand. Are, 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 you really, are you really taking a stand? I think now would be a great time for the church to really take a stand. And what does that mean? That means that we actually begin to honestly connect with our creator. We begin to connect with our community. We begin to have conversations that actually really matter. And these are the conversations that matter. What's it going to take to see God's kingdom come? What's it going to take to see God's will be done? What's it going to take to see in Seattle as it is in heaven? Those are the conversations that really matter. What's it going to take? to see 300 people come to know Jesus, discipled, demons cast out uh, every single quarter. What's it, what, what's it gonna take? It's gonna take you. Now, what's it gonna take to see 500? What's it gonna take to see 1,000? Darren, it's not about numbers. Well, it is to the Lord. Why? Numbers represent people. There's a lot of people in our region that are going to hell, and we need to begin to care a little bit more for lost souls than we care about the Democrats ruining our country. It's time for things that really matter to the Lord to matter to us. It is time for us to untether from this cosmic wisdom where we're ascribing to human rabbis while having and hosting all this division in our heart towards other Christians and other traditions thinking that we have more importance. That this is such a beautiful time for us to upgrade. But the only way we upgrade is we repent from our foolish thinking, from our foolish living, and from acting like mere mortals. From acting and behaving like humans. Paul says, I would love to give you some meat, but all I can give you is breast milk. Why? You're acting like you don't have teeth. This is not just a message for the believers in Corinth. This is not just a first century letter to a first century church. This is a letter, a message to the United, to the believers, the church of the United States of America, and to us at Seattle Revival Center. We're going to build. We're going to build together every believer with influence and authority, understanding their identity, that every member would be equipped into works of ministry. Why? Because Darren Stott is not going to build the Seattle Revival Center. This, that I, I am not committed to build a platform for my own fame. Sorry, I'm not going to do it. That I am going to partner together with, with friends and with family to build a platform where sons and daughters can step into their identity in their authority and their destiny in Jesus Christ to create a center of healing where sickness and infirmity cannot remain, to create a place where humans are not worshipped, where Darren is not worshipped, to create a place where Jesus the Christ is worshipped, that this will not be a Trump rally. This is the temple of the Lord. This is our time to upgrade. The Lord spoke to me this last week and he said, SRC is upgrading. The, the, the entire church, the entire body, children's ministry and youth ministry, upgrading. And what, what I thought was interesting is he said from version 
to version 7.0. I thought that, that I thought that was really interesting. That we're 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 upgrading from this from from from, and I and I just connected this to the text just now because he said you're acting like humans, you're acting like man. That we are about to get upgraded as a church from a six to a seven, from man into completion, from man into Melchizedek, from, 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 from attempts to a manifestation of the kingly and the priestly, from toil and to rest. And the way that we will come into this is through repentance and willingness to let the comfort and convenience of tradition go and to be radically inconvenienced by this big, fat word that Jesus said, it's time to go and good news everything. And good news it, good news it, good news it until an alternative, until an alternative, until a contrasting realm begins to appear, until a portal begins to open, until a wardrobe begins, until this, play, until things begin, to, all of a sudden we realize earth is starting to look a lot more like Eden again. A company of Enoch's sons and daughters who fellowship with the Father. A company of, 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 of a generation of sons and daughters who know, fear, love, and commune with their God. That's what we're going after. That's what we're going after in this time. That's what we're going after in this year. Everything's changing. Why? Because the church is under fire. That which is good, pure, holy, it will remain. That is good. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your grace because we cannot make anything happen. God, your spirit is moving. Your voice is roaring over the waters. And Father, I pray that we would have the courage and the humility that we would have ears to hear what your spirit is saying in this time and in this day. And Father, I pray that we would be willing to chase after this moving God, this, this, the, 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 that we would have the courage to say that human convenience and that which is cosmic is, can, pr can provide the repetition and provide this place of stability where we feel comfortable. But in this time, Lord, we will lay down our comfort and our convenience in order to partner with your power and your authority in this age. Lord, our, our answer is yes. Father, we thank you that you have provided a foundation for Seattle Revival Center. And that foundation is Christ Jesus himself. And Lord, we pray that you'd be glorified. Be glorified through our words. Be glorified through our heart posture. Be glorified, Father, through our teaching. Be glorified through our singing. Be glorified through our, our jobs and studies. Be glorified in our lives, God. We love you. We, we want you. And we trust you. In Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. 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 God bless you. Love you.